So I want you to lift your hands a moment because I'm, I'm, I'm going to share a, a short message on are you ready? The second coming of Jesus is upon us. Are, are you ready? I want you to touch your name and say, are you ready? It's upon us, folks. Just play a few chords, Tino. Not going to be long. Folks, I want you to know, as we were studying the Bible yesterday, Andrew was there, Danny was studying, saying, Jesus is coming. We were looking at Zechariah chapter 14. We're looking at Romans, that the fullness of Gentiles might come in, Romans eleven twenty five, yeah. that all of Israel might be Amen. saved. You know, eight, I mean, listen, 80% of, of, his, of Israelis are not saved. God wants to save them. Amen. I don't know if you know this, but my, fr- my friend James Sedaris has paid for our entire family to go to Israel Amen. in July. I mean, isn't that beautiful? I've always wanted to go. Just play a few chords, Tino. And I'm going to Israel. And I believe, it's, I believe part of the reason, I said, Lord, before you come, let me go to Israel. There's the door. It's opened. I'm also connecting with, so I'm going to preach. Because I, I, I tell I love the Jewish people. Amen. And, you know, in my earlier ministry, as I listened to all kinds of people and prayed, and, and, and I have never, ever, ever, ever disbelieved that God would ever shut, shut the door to the, to the nation of Israel, ever. I don't subscribe to replacement theology, that the modern-day church has replaced Israel. I believe the modern-day church of the Gentiles has been grafted in. Can I get an amen? amen? That the fullness of the Gentiles might come in, that God might turn his attention to the Middle East. And if you read Zechariah 14, it'll, it'll scare, it'll scare, I was going to say scare the, the pants off you, but that might not be so biblical. It would scare something off you, wouldn't it? How do you know? He's coming back. Amen. Are you ready, Winston? Are you ready, Terry? Are you ready, Hannah? Are you ready? You know, sometimes we say little nice little things from the pulpit. It's just a group of us here today and watching on the broadcast. But are you ready? Because you know what? I think that's a, a rhetorical question. He said, are you ready? We go, oh, yes. Really? I want you to pray before I get into this. Lift your hands with me and say, Father, am I, am I ready? Because if I'm not ready, I could be like a foolish virgin and I haven't really prepared. And I'm going to be, I'm going to suffer loss. So, Lord... I need to get ready, Yana. I need to get ready. You know, I got ready to get here today. I didn't just roll out of bed. Look at this. I got, I got ready, showered, shaved, uh, makeup, everything. I mean, there's a lot to do. You gotta get. You gotta get. Lift your. You gotta get ready, Peter. You gotta get ready, George. You gotta get ready, Melissa. Andrew, you gotta get ready. And you can't keep thinking about all your problems. And what? Oh, well, God, what about what about what about me? You know, that's half the problem. God will deal with you. God will deliver you. God will set you free. But are you ready for his coming and what that means in terms of engaging with the people of your day and generation? And some of you say, well, I haven't been a very good witness. No, you haven't. But lift your hands right now and watch it on the broadcast and say, God, change me. Because you know what? I can't fool around anymore. You know, I want to say, are you ready? God's, I'm just going to exhort for a little bit because I just feel it by the Spirit of God. You know what? I have not watched television for months. You say, well, that's a bit extreme. You know what? God broke me. He brought us God, think of the thousands of hours that I've sat watching documentaries. Nothing particularly wrong. Football games. Oh, Lord. West Ham. Dear God, forgive. It just it hit me. I thought, Lord, I've wasted hours and hours. I'll never get that back. Now, I'm not trying to beat myself up. Ever say Grace. See, it's not legalism, it's grace, great grace. But you know what? I just began to think, Terry, and sometimes when you get older, you know what I'm saying? You just start to realize, hey, I don't have as much time in the hourglass as I think. When I preached to my atheist friend, Mark, on Tuesday, I prayed about him and I said, Lord, what do I share? And he said, Cliff Richard. So I, I, shared, I said, Mark, do you know Cliff Richard? He said, oh, yes, I know Cliff Richard. I said, you know, there's a song that he sings. I looked him in the eyes and I said, Mark, this is for you. I could talk for hours, but you wouldn't hear a word. Your own opinion makes you blind. There will come a morning when the sand has all run out. It'll be too late to change your mind. Like a thief in the night, he will come. And I tell you what, I've had loads of discussions with him. For a moment, he didn't know what to say. 
I saw the, the Adam's apple. You know the Adam's apple? It went... <laughs> speechless. How have you know there's coming a time where there's no more, let's turn the hourglass over and let... Uh, you know what? Everybody say proclamation, proclamation. demonstration. I, I don't have time with atheists, agnostics, humanists, syncretists. I'm just going to say, look, I'll give them a couple of minutes. Right, you've had your couple of minutes now. Let me lay hands on you and I will show you my God. I will pray for you and demonstrate supernatural grace, ability to open blind eyes, set the captives free, release the power of God. Even the Hare Krishnas that railed on me again. I let them speak for two, three minutes. And while they were speaking, I was praying in the spirit because what they were saying was utter nonsense. And then I said, can I just share one thing with you? What you sow is what you reap. He, he kept on about his consciousness, the level of consciousness. I said, look, I debated with the philosopher. He told me, you got a short path to salvation, got a medium path, and a very long path. I said, but that is all too long for me. What do you think you were in your previous life, and what will you be in your next? He said, I don't know, but I'm on that path. <laughs> Who agrees with me? It's ridiculous. So then I shared with him Hebrews 9, 27. And I said, it's appointed to a man once to die after that the judgment once to die after that the judgment once and I just kept repeating that in love in love then he manifested and it started railing on me then two more came and said and started railing on me and in the end they went off down the street and I, you remember I was quite nice I said you know what I'm glad you're on the pathway of enlightenment but turn to Jesus turn to Jesus it's not too late for you Hare Krishna it's not to, the whole street hood I'm not ashamed of the gospel I believe there will be some hostility and some conflict, but if you handle it well, you're skilled and handle it well, you can deal with it. Amen. But are you ready? Because he's coming like a thief in the night. And to get ready, there has to be a shift. Now, first of all, I'm going to share with you there are 10 keys. If Whether I share them or not, straight out of my book again, there are 10 keys on get ready, he's coming. So get ready, he's coming. Are you ready? But, but first of all, we have to see why is it that we are so disengaged and why are we not ready? Everybody say, why are we not ready? Quickly, 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 I'm going to give them to you. So you need to type faster than a, than a one arm paper hanger. Let me tell you, the reason we're not ready and the reason we're not engaging in sharing the gospel with neighbors, friends, relatives, aunties, uncles, the reason we're not writing the letters, the reason we're not sowing the books, the reason we're not giving out the tracts is because these things have happened to us and they've caused us to become disengaged and we keep thinking, deluded in our minds, that there's still time. No one knows the day nor the hour, but he's coming. As it was, Matthew, uh, I believe it's uh, 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 Matthew, is it 24, 37? No, the, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were given in marriage. Yes, it is. Until the day that Noah entered the ark and eight were saved, but the flood came. So it's going to be at the coming of the Son of Man. Everybody said the coming of the Son of Man is going to be that. They're just going to be carrying on like they were. But we're, we're deluding ourselves thinking, well, we've got time. Well, what if, what if you didn't? You see, I believe one of the great things an evangelist does is bring to the, to the consciousness, use that word, or bring to the, to, to the conscience the reality of eternity. We haven't got time. God has set eternity in your hearts, Ecclesiastes 3.11. But Winston, it's now. Simon, it's now. And if you don't make that mind shift to, to, towards that reality, you will continue with television pastimes. People miss church for, for minor things. The, the child had a cold. Or there's an event. Or there's a family situation. Folks, I want you to say this and watch it on the broadcast. Lift up your hand. Say, Lord, I need urgency. I need urgency. I need urgency to grip me with, with, with a heaven and hell black and white reality. Now here's the nine things that start to happen to all the folks who think they've got time. This is what happens. You got a pen? I'm going to real quickly. Number one, here's what happens. Disappointment creeps into your life and the devil sees to it. Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. So there's something that will happen in your life that will cause a disappointment. Am I right or am I wrong? And then as a result of that disappointment, you get depressed. And you think, oh, well, it never happened. And you start getting into Plom's disease. Everybody say Plom. P-L-O-M. Poor little old me. And so you start rehearsing in your mind, well, I've been rejected. <laughs> Nobody loves me. Pastor didn't prophesy. I didn't receive anything. I didn't talk to anyone. 
Everybody say P-L-O-M, Plom's disease. Disappointment. Number two, real quickly, failure starts to set in when disappointment becomes the fruit of your existence. Going quickly. Don't have time to develop this. Number three, the next thing after failure is discouragement. Tremendous discouragement starts to overtake your life from within the church and outside the church. Even prophetic words, instead of encouraging you, start discouraging you. And you start to take on a burden that God never gave you. Matthew eleven twenty eight. He says, my burden is light and my yoke is easy. Is this microphone going to work or do we need to replace it? Can I get an amen? And, and, and this is what I prayed for Danny last week. I said, Danny, stop trying to walk in the prophecies of what I haven't even walked into at nearly 56 years of age. Can I get an amen? Because it's a, it starts to become a burden to you. If God's called you to do something, everybody say, if God's called you to do something, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. If you're walking around with the whole world on top of your shoulders, something's gone wrong. Now, how many of you love your pastor and the evangelist? Now, you've seen me at times when I've got the whole world on my shoulders. I'm not as joyful as this, am I? I'm like, oh, God. You've got to shake it off. Everybody say, shake it off like a dog and keep going. Number four, here's what happens after discouragement, wounding. And as that wounding starts to creep in, it's a sad thing that only Christians shoot the wounded. Best not to shoot one. One day you might be one yourself. Wounding is one of the biggest reasons why Christians start disengaging from going to church, going to the prayer meetings, giving, sharing the gospel. You're wounded. Well, if you're wounded, get healed. I don't have time to develop this, but there's not one who's not been wounded. Wounding brings trauma. Who knows that? Trauma. So wounding. Who's been wounded? Who hasn't been wounded? Come and get a wounding on the house. Lift your hands again and say, wounding is normal. Get healed. Number, number, number five, criticism creeps in after that. Criticism. So here's what happens. Instead of taking graciously the preaching or the word of God, you begin to twist it and say, well, hang on a sec. It doesn't say that. I can find something that says something else. Or you'll listen to a voice that's contrary to the voice you heard on Sunday in the pulpit to justify the stance that you're taking. Yeah. Now, don't try to say you don't do it because you do. Yeah. You try to do it because what happens is criticism. Well, I, didn't, I don't agree with that, that everyone should be evangelizing. Of course, don't you know that only a small percentage of people in any church are the ones that are aggressive and are evangelistic, and the other 95% don't have that gift? Somebody lift up your hand, say false teaching, false doctrine, false teaching. Everybody lift your hand, say pastors, evangelists, apostles, bishops, epistles, men, women, boys, girls, all evangelize, 100%. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Number six, after the criticism comes the big, the stinger offenses. you got to learn to walk in the Spirit because the minute offense starts to take over your life, discouragement gets bigger, criticism gets bigger, negative attitudes start to start, it's, it's, it's like, like a cloud over you and the inevitable takes place. Nobody wants it, but you cannot allow those things to take you out of the battle. See, I believe David himself in 2 Samuel 11 was already starting to develop this. It was a time of spring when kings go to war. Who knows what happened? Instead of being at war where he should have been, he was on the wrong place, on top of the roof, watching a high-definition 42-inch uh, uh, screen of Bathsheba taking a bath. Who knew that? You should have been at, at war fighting, not looking at Bathsheba having a bath. And as a result of David, who was warned not to take foreign wives, let alone Solomon, who took even more, Everybody say treachery, treason, and trespass stayed in his house, even though God still used him. Everybody say wrong place, wrong time, wrong thinking, wrong association, wounding, criticism, offense. And out of that offense, I, you know, I can't prove this to you, but I think I can. Out of that stance that he took of being executive, of thinking he's above everybody else, then all those things started to develop in his life which led to murder with Uriah the Hittite. Who read the story? Uriah the Hittite came back. He tried to get him drunk and then put him in the front line of the battle and said, withdraw so that he would be murdered. All because of an indiscretion. I was reading Derek Prince yesterday. He said, how ridiculous. Everybody say simple obedience. And he said, yet for simple obedience, some Christians will have one night of illicit sex. One night of smoking a joint or getting drunk or, or hanging out with a bunch of people and destroy their entire future. Now, how many of us all here today understand that and lift up our hands and say, it's just not worth it. It just ain't worth it. It's not worth it. Dear God, come on, everybody, lift your hands and watch and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, it ain't worth it. It ain't worth it in Jesus' name. 
good preaching. Say, good preaching, pastor. Good preaching. So what happens? That then begins to set in, and you see what happens. Lack of motivation, lack of revelation, and a spirit takes over called laziness. Good preaching? It's, it's too good, folks. I've studied this. I've researched it. I've done this. So, you know, just receive it. And then the last one, or the last two, is this. After that, intellectualism takes over. You begin to intellectualize, and you begin to intellectualize your Christianity, which dismisses you from engagement to the Great Commission. Yeah. Lift your hand and say, ooh, ouch, ee, ouch, ooh, ooh, ee, ouch, ouch, ouch. You see, it, what happens is, is this intellectualism starts to take on an emphasis in your life where it's more knowledge than relationship. It's more heart than relationship. That will lead to an institutionalism, a structure, a hierarchy, and it shuts out God. That's what religion does. It shuts God out. Christianity, even the word Christianity, what does that mean? Are you born again? What, are you born again? And, and what happened in the dark ages was intellectualism, dead hierarchy, killed the life of the church, and so the anointing went out the door. Now here's the last one. Everybody say the last one. Is sometimes you think you're successful. And that success leads to complacency. Everybody say, I've not finished until I've graduated in the school of Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. Now I'm going to give it to you real quick. Here we go. Here are the 10 keys to get you ready. Number one, real quick, real quick, in my book, page 93 and 94. Here we go. First of all, Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he would have the preeminence. Say, number one, everybody lift your hands, wave them around, because I can see you getting tired now. There's only be five minutes. Say, wave your hands, say, number one, get in right relationship. Say, number one, come on, say, get in right relationship. You know what? You will never be ready if you're not in right relationship. Everybody say, I've got to be in a kingdom local church. Not a religious local church. Say, kingdom local church. He's coming back. You know what? If I was not a minister, an apostolic evangelist, I would want to be in the church where the most radical preacher in Watford was. And I don't mean radical akin to Islam because that's not what we're talking about. I mean radical in terms of obedience and fire and passion for Jesus. Who agrees with me? If I was not a minister of the gospel, I'd want to go to Steve Mal's church. I'm not trying to make more of me than I should. I'm nothing. Listening. Because I know people get really get, get it wrong. I'm nothing, but the greater one in me is something. And the greater one in me has got something to say about this subject. Because the greater one in me is not impressed with what he sees in Watford. I was reading the scriptures the other day and I thought, thank you, Jesus, I found it. I can justify my whole existence. It said, and Paul was greatly annoyed. The apostle Paul was greatly annoyed and turned to and said, you'll be blind for a season. I thought, hallelujah, I found a scripture that suits me. How many, could, how many of you know, and Paul was greatly annoyed? How many of you know that apostolic anointing can see what's going on in a region and be greatly annoyed? You know what? I'm greatly annoyed that there's 40, 50 churches here, and yet we're not reaching the harvest at all. I'm greatly annoyed that there's 150, 200,000 people going to hell. I'm greatly annoyed that the cults and the world religions are dominating Hertfordshire. I'm greatly annoyed that people decided not to come to church today. Didn't even bother to send in a request to say why or where they were going or what they were doing, but never bothered to come. I'm greatly annoyed that I see this area of Hertfordshire, middle class Hertfordshire, going to hell rapidly. Is anybody with me? I'm greatly annoyed at that. I want to see a change. Does anybody else want to see that change? Can I get an amen? And so number one, everybody say, get in right relationship to the head, Christ. Get in true submission and authority. Say submission and authority. You see, I tell you what, we had, a, we had an event the other day. And there was this, and some outsiders come in, and often they've got a thing or two to say. But the issue is, is they're not in right relationship to any authority. We've had we've had people come to our ministry who are not in right relationship to authority. Everybody, lift up your hands and say, "I need to be in right relationship to authority." For this reason, I need a pastor or an apostolic leader over me in the Lord to correct me. Amen. Submission and authority, and whenever that issue comes up in people's lives, rebellion rises up and they leave. I want you to say this after me. Every addiction has a root of rebellion. Say it again. Every addiction has a root of rebellion. Say it again. Every addiction has a root of rebellion, including pride, where you know better than the leader. 
Folks, I never asked to be this. God, God did it. The smart person, lift up your hands washing, say the smart person will always submit to an authority over them. That's why whatever Dr. Dyson says is what Dr. Dyson says. And if I'm a smart man, and I am, I submit my life, say submit my life, I obey and I listen, and I don't contradict him, interrupt him. I receive what he says and say, thank you, Dr. Dyson. It's wisdom for my life. Now, you lift up your hand, all you tinkers here and watching on the broadcast, and say, if it's good for Dr. Dyson, and it's good for Derek Prince, who had a ministry that shook the world, that he still submitted to authority, then I want you to say, it's good for me. In Jesus' name. Amen. No amen. Can you get an amen? amen? Number two, we need to wake up. Everybody say, Christ is coming. Wake up. He's the head, not the tail. Number three, going real quickly, going real quickly. No, go, here's what we need, folks. We need a vision. We need, we need to get a vision. Proverbs 29, 18. For where there is no uh, vision, there... Let me just change that. Over. I'm running out of... I need to get one of those fancy, this is so tiny, this, this pulpit. I need a big glass thing. You know, I, need, I think I've qualified for one of those. This is so, so too tiny. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Vision. See, Proverbs 29, 18. For where there is no vision, there the people perish. You know what? I'm annoyed there's not much vision in Watford. I'm, I'm annoyed. Are you annoyed now, Ozzy? I, I'm annoyed that there's not much vision. I'm not talking about here. I'm just saying there's not much vision. Because if there really was vision in Watford, you'd have every pastor get with his saints out there. You'd, you, there'd be stuff going round the clock. There'd be intercessory prayer. There would be stuff going on night and day, night and day. But everyone's carrying on making daisy chains like it's never going to happen, like he's not coming back. William Booth had a vision of people going to hell. And there he saw on the, on the shores were all the Christians making the daisy chains, doing good things, good things. And on the other side were all the souls perishing, saying, help, somebody help, as they were sinking into hell. Who thinks William, William Booth is, is, is worthy of a, of, of a mention and, and, and an example that might be good to follow? Amen. He said these words, go for souls, go for the worst. Let's do it again, go for souls. Go for the worst. You see, uh, I'm exhorting you day in, year in, week out, week, week in, day in. Come on, wake up. He's coming back. Share the gospel. You know what? You're going to suffer loss. Watching on the broadcast 1 Corinthians 3, you will suffer loss. You will stand at the Bema seat of Christ and you will look into the piercing eyes of Jesus. You'll see the nail pierced hand and he'll say, didn't you listen to Pastor Steve? Didn't you listen to the message at OCC? Didn't you listen? You say, yes, I listened many times, but I thought it was just him. I thought it was just him because he's always like that. Come on, lift up your hands and say, dear God, something's got to change. Something's got to happen. Something's got to shake me out of this. Something's got to get me engaging because it is happening. It's happening right now. This is why I've turned off that television. This is why some of you might have to come off Facebook. You might have to come off social internet sites and get on your knees. You might have to turn off that computer. You might have to put aside some of your, your racing car magazines and your mistress under the bed and one in the cupboard with cricket bats and carrots. So what is a carrot doing in a cricket bat? Don't worry, Simon, I'm as bemused as you are. Could be allegory. Could be a parable. Could be factual. Come on, lift up your hands and say, men, stop hiding. Women, stop hiding. Church, stop hiding. Stop playing games. Get committed. Get committed. Get to the prayer meeting. Get to church. Get on the outreach. Make a nuisance of your life for the remainder of your life. Get engaged. Have a go. You know, I, 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 how many of you remember Ray Silver? My friend. I mentioned him again because he's worthy of a mention. You know, I remember Ray Silver, Mexican event. Love him. Bold, bright, cheerful, powerful. Walks into a massive restaurant in the United States of America. And, you know, I'm, and I'm sort of being quite British at that particular moment. Sort of walking in with him and he gets in and he, he steps in. He doesn't say, good, good, good afternoon and we're here for lunch. He, he, he shouts, I'm in love! With the man. The entire place, about a thousand people look around. He says, his name is Jesus. 
Now, how many of you are going to do that? Amen. Peter will do it. Amen. Steve Mayle will do it. Amen. Ray Silver will do it. Amen. Now, as he wouldn't do that, it's not his style. And he's the first to admit it. What I'm trying to say is don't be Ray Silver, don't be Niazi. But be yourself. But do something in your life. Come on, jolt yourself. Give yourself a little bit of a jolt. Because otherwise, you're always going to meander through life the way you've always have done. You know, it's, 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 it's partly our British heritage. Come on, just wave it. Wave, wave as we're finishing up now. It's part of our heritage that, you know, we're well-cultured, well-educated. We don't actually ever do anything like that, you see, because it's not really conducive to friendly relations and neighborly, uh, you know, what's the word, sort of being affable and so, so kind. Talk about plants, geraniums, Jerusalems. Jerusalems, that's not a plant. you all got to laugh. The other day with Andrew, we were, we were looking at my garden and we were looking at one of my hedges. And we were like, wow, look at that. You haven't even noticed. And through the hedge was this amazing pink blossom that had grown up through the hedge. And both of us were perplexed, amazed, because I'm not really a gardener, but I like the garden. And I said, look at that. Never in all my life have I ever seen such a beautiful purple head come out of that bush. In fact, I thought that's the first time I've ever seen that, wasn't it, Andrew? Only to examine behind the hedge was a tulip. And the tulip had grown up through the hedge with this beautiful flower. So the hedge didn't actually give birth to a tulip. (laughs) Now, what are you, a tulip or a hedge? You've got to ask the question. If you're a hedge, you're not a tulip. But right now, I want you to lift your hand and say, God, would you let the tulip push through the hedge so that the beauty... I just said, was like, (laughs) you confused me. (laughs) In Espanol, mira, hay un árbol así, tan grande así. Y el dentro del árbol viene una florcita así, rojito. ¿Entendés? Entonces yo te digo, este es un árbol o una florcita. Por eso yo te digo, mira, es importante la florcita de su vida. Si, si así empujas abajo el árbol, así. Ah, that's in Spanish. Ah, now, you get it now. He still don't get it. <laughs> Let's go into Mexican then. Let me go into French. Petit pois, l'anglais, chufla. Indonesian. Salamat pagan, mali, puji tuhan, bapa terima kasih banyak. Come on, lift up your hands on the broadcast. Say, Lord, let the beauty of my life not be a hedge, but let it be a blossom. Let something push through in me. Let something push through in me. Push through in me. Push through in me. I need to see a vision, not just of a hedge, but I need to see something above the hedge, through the hedge. I need to push through that beauty comes out of my life. Number five, if you don't get that vision, the devil will fill you with his. Number, number six, you need a revelation. Come on, lift your hands and say, I need a revelation. See, revelation produces action. If it's just more information for you today, you say, well, that was nice. A lot of people do that with my preaching, Winston. They go, that was nice. More information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, wow, lovely information. You become an information computer. We're living in the days of computer technology. You can store lots of information in this thing here. Yes, billions and billions and billions of bits of information. And all that information inside your giant head does absolutely nothing at all. Because the information that you've got in here, that it doesn't connect with here, does nothing here, or here, or even here with your legs. Everybody say, all this information in here is absolutely worthless and of no use at all. Until that information touches this heart and causes a transformation which makes my legs move, one after the other, like that, you see. I love my preaching, even if you don't. Tina, keep playing. We're almost done, mate. I'll buy you a pizza. <laughs> Very hard work today, Tino. You just, you know, just between you and me and the gatepost, sometimes I don't know what I'm doing down here. <laughs> me and you, mate, we're having a great time. Sometimes I feel like saying, go and have a coffee, a mochaccino or something, and come back, you know. And when you've done that, then we'll just pray. Take up a miracle offering, and you and me will go to Hawaii. Lift your hands, everybody, and say, we love the pastor, really. It's a strange man. (laughs) Everybody say, number seven, the revelation must make the passionate church. The passionate church. Number eight, I must begin to cry like Hannah. She cried, God, give me that child. 
See, you know what I'm crying for? Here's my child. See, what's making your baby jump today, Nadia? I'm not talking about a lip. You don't understand what I'm saying. See, what, 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 what's, what's your vow? What's your hand? See, what, what's making my, you know what's making my baby jump today, Niazi? I always pick on Niazi. He's, he's becoming famous on my messages. People know him now. You know what's making my baby jump today, Niazi? What's making my baby jump today is this. I don't want to go out until I've seen at least a million people saved. You know what? I, I don't care. Some people say, you're deluded. Look at you. You're 56 almost. It hasn't happened. So what makes you believe, Steve, now it's going to happen? I don't know, Niazi. I, I don't understand defeat. I don't understand uh, disappointment. I, it's, I, it's not in my vocabulary. Apparently in the Eskimo language, there's no word for forgiveness. Didn't know that. But I'll tell you what, lift your hands, everybody. In my, in my language of kingdom, I don't understand defeat. I don't understand disappointment because my God says you're going to do it. And you know what? It, you, call me deluded. But I'm going to keep going until, until my ticker's given out that I'm going to believe God, Terry. I'm going to believe God, Eloisa. Now, I know some of you are not quite where I am, and that's okay. That's why you've got to catch up. But I'll tell you what, I'm not going out until I've seen a million saved Amen. or several million saved Amen. or I've influenced several million or I've written the books to touch several million or I've recorded the song that's going to touch. You say, well, that's your ego. It's, no, it's not. It's God. Amen. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm, I'm shot to ribbons in, as far as ego goes. Look at this. And some people say, well, when you reach the, you know, in your 50s, the executive level, you're sitting back with your pad in Hawaii. Well, Niazi can, but I can't. Listen, I've got nothing to show. Lift your hands up. I've got nothing to show. I'm not talking about any kind of accolade or any kind of thing that says, wow, look, at you did well, really. I don't have a career. I'm not a barrister. The only barrister I would be, the one that makes coffee. <laughs> Same thing, isn't it? You knew that was coming, didn't you, Niazi? <laughs> Come on, lift your hands, everybody. It's getting good now. Lift your hands. Come on, say, listen, it's not a worldly accolade. It's none of that. And I'll tell you something. Although, although Niazi is a barrister, I've got to say this to embarrass him. I'll tell you what, his heart for the kingdom is exemplary. Because he's, he's, he, his heart for the kingdom is greater than being the barrister. But he's worked hard for that. And I want you to lift your hands on this video broadcast and say, you know what? Hard work is necessary right now. Hard work is necessary because I'm not going out without a shout. I'm not going out without the victory. I'm not going out without at least a million souls or more saved under the ministry. Because I'm not going to go to heaven empty-handed. I refuse. I, uh, you know what? I, I don't know what defeat is, Nina. I don't know what it is, Winston. I don't I don't know what it is because I only know victory, blessing, breakthrough, overflow, joy. I know some people say, well, Steve Mel's an enigma. He's an anomaly. He's all those things. Hallelujah. He's a jelly belly as well. Hallelujah. He's a sticky toffee pudding. He's a stuffy sticky pudding. The other day I said, I'll have a stiffy stocky. I couldn't get it out. How many of you know when you're trying to say something, you get your words muddled up? I said, I'll have a, I'll have a sticky stuffy snooding. Uh, a snuffy snicky snooty. Anyway. Come on, lift up your hands and say, it's not over till it's over. But I know God's got victory that's going to come in these last days. Number nine, you got that revelation. Number eight was that, what are you? Are you going to pray the Hannah prayer? Who's going to pray the Hannah prayer? Lord, give me, give me, give me the man child. For me, it's God, I want millions of souls. What, what's, your, what's your prayer, Terry? What's your prayer? Touch your neighbor say, what's your prayer before you leave the earth? What's your prayer? Come on, get a prayer. Get a prayer in your life. Get a prayer going in your life. What's your prayer, Hannah? Before you leave the earth. And number nine, get into the battle. If you're right with the head, get into the battle. And number 10, this is the finale. It's just a five minute message that's 25. Obey the last words of the gospel. You hear that? It's a five minute message that's 25. Obey the last words of the gospel. The two most important statements of Jesus, Peter, those listening, watching, will be this Go. Well done. Let's say it again. Go. And well done. Don't, if you've not obeyed the first, don't expect the affirmation of the second. Everybody say, go. Well done. Stand up with me. Are you ready? Are you ready? 
watching on that broadcast right now, stretch out your hands watching on that broadcast. If people are watching on the broadcast today and you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus, but I'd like to. Uh, I've not known the Lord Jesus, but I'd like to. I want you to pray with me and I want you to uh, 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 pray on the broadcast. Pray this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I repent of all sin and every sin and I invite Jesus Christ to come into my life and to wash me free uh, by the blood of Jesus and to wash away all my sins. I receive you right now. Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, and take my life and take my future and take my days and fill me with passion for I need to get ready for you are coming soon.